So we're in the book of Acts. We're finishing up the book of Acts, and then we're going to the book of Galatians. So go to Acts, the 28th chapter. You know, last Sunday, as we were uh, 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 going through our lessons, and we're still in the early church stage, uh, Paul, he's on his way to Rome along with some other prisoners, and they had a shipwreck. You know, Paul had, um, Paul told them, look, y'all don't need to do this. This is what we were talking about, humility. But because of their lack of humility, they did not listen to what he said. And so as they were driving on, the weather seemed to have gotten better. But then all of a sudden, it took a turn for the worse. And when it took a turn for the worse, Paul said, see, <laughs> y'all should have listened to me. I tried to tell you, but you didn't listen. Because sometimes people look at you and try to determine based upon how you look. And y'all, that happens to us more often than not. People will look at you and try to uh, determine your worth based on your outside appearance, based on you know where you came from. Lady Deborah, that used to bother me more. I'm sure it bothers me still, but more. And until God gave me an understanding, and, and that is, uh, no, I don't care if a person in the house with you. They don't know who you are until God show you who. Yeah. So it's really not their fault. And that's mother. That's when I get real messed up when I start to fight against flesh and blood. When I start getting angry at another person about them being who they are, yeah. instead of realizing that basically that person is the spirit that 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 has them, and they can't help it. They can't help it. So you're, you're frustrating. And Satan has you right where he wants you because now you're fighting against another person. And neither one of y'all nobody. Neither one of y'all don't know nothing. So now, you know, he, just, he, he got what he wants. Absolutely. And so the, the, the ship, they, it wrecked. <laughs> and so, uh, but Paul just encouraged them as he had been encouraged. Uh, saying that no one would be lost. Look at uh, chapter 27 and uh, look at verse 22. Chapter 27 and verse 22. Paul says this, he says, And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am, and uh, whom I serve, uh, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar. Stop right there and say what God says, it has to come to pass. What God says, it has to come to pass. I don't know. You know, it may be some time between when he said it. And when it actually comes to pass, but no, I never doubt, never doubt one time that God just talks to be talking. Never doubt that. No, 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 no. When God says it, if he says it in 1962, it may not come to pass until 2021, but it's coming to pass. God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he has to repent. For whatever he said, he's able to do it. And he does it right well. Let me add that too. His ability is above everybody else's ability. And I'm so grateful to God. Now it takes me a time sometimes to realize that, Pastor Bland. That's when, uh, as these uh, uh, persons on the ship did, when you want to walk in your own ability. It takes me a minute to realize that God's ability is so much more than what I have. And then what I have to realize is the only reason I have any ability at all is because he gave it to me. So when, you, when you put that in the right perspective and when you look at it the way it really is, that's freedom. That's real liberty. And, and your ability is going to fall short. So Absolutely. Don't, don't sit around looking stupid when it does. Absolutely. You know, like, oh, how come I couldn't do it? You, you, you weren't supposed to do it. You, you're not going to be able to complete it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's go over to uh, chapter 27, verse 39. Are you there? 
And when it was day, they knew not the land, but they discovered a certain creek with a shore into the which they were minded if it were possible to thrust in the ship. And when they had taken up their anchors, they committed themselves unto the sea and loosed the rudder, bands, and hoisted up the mainsail to the wind and made toward shore. And falling into a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground and they, uh, the forepart struck fast and remained unmovable, but the hinder part was broken with the violence of the waves. So they hit a sandbar, basically, what is what that is. You know, they just ran into the sandbar. And other than the, if they, I guess, you know, God does all things in order. That was there just for them, for their protection, even though the ship cracked up, broke up. And so uh, in verse 42, it says, and the soldier's counsel was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim out and escape. But the centurion, willing to save Paul, kept them from their purpose. I think the gods, gods, just his, uh, his, uh, his watchful eye over everything that uh, takes place, his providence, his providence, that's what we call providence. So he had everything in place so Paul could make it to uh, his destination and make it there safely. Uh, and we can go back from the very beginning, and let's just, just do that just for a moment. From the very beginning, as Paul began his ministry from the onset, there were people uh, lying or laying in wait to kill him, to snuff out his purpose to quiet his voice about the gospel uh, of, of grace, the, the goodness of God. There were people waiting to just uh, silence him. But through God's providence, God allowed him to make it through all of those missions that he had to go set up those churches. Uh, God uh, left it here for him, made a way for him to be able to minister back to them by writing these epistles that we're getting ready to go into. And then not only that, God allowed him to minister to those who uh, he was around even in his imprisonment. So God had everything set up the way it was supposed to be set up. And so uh, Luke tells us here that uh, this centurion, uh, because he wanted to save Paul uh, there, he commanded that they which could swim should cast themselves first into the sea and get to land. And verse 44 says, and the rest, some on boards and some on broken pieces of the ship. And so it came to pass that they escaped all safe to land. But I want you to know it doesn't matter how you get to the land as long as you get to the land. Isn't that right? As long as you're safe and you can get to the land, everything is going to be all right. And so, uh, you know, the thing, thing about it is you got to stay in the ship. You got to stay in the ship and then you got to follow the orders what that's told to you. Amen. Amen. And so uh, in verse 20, in chapter 28, uh, and when they were escaped, then they knew that the island uh, was called Melita. And the barbarous uh, people showed us no little kindness, for they kindled a fire and received us, everyone, because of the present rain and because of the cold. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, no doubt this man is a murderer, whom though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. They said he might've got out of that shipwreck alive, but he's not gonna escape that snake uh, biting him. He's not going to escape that. But look at what God did. And so, uh, Paul in verse five said, and he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. Howbeit they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly, but after they had looked a great while 
and saw no harm. Oh, let's stop right there, Pastor Bland, and say that it is something when people are waiting on your demise, when people wait for you to fail. So they were watching, trying to see, not running to his aid. Well, if the snake had bitten him, okay, we need to go and do something about it. But they were watching and waiting for him to fall dead. Y'all, and it's people that wait, that are waiting for us to fail. You know, I don't know what it is that would give them pleasure in seeing someone else fail. And let's not be guilty of that. Let's not wait around and watch around and rejoice in someone else's failing. That, that's, that, is, uh, that is not the way we would behave or we should behave as believers. We're supporters. We are supporters of each other. And so uh, in verse 7, now, okay, because he didn't fall dead, now they think that, oh, my God, he is God. He is a God. He is a God. So in verse 7 says, In the same quarters were possessions of the chief man of the island, whose name was Publius, who received us and lodged us three days courteously. And it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and of a bloody flux, to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. So when this was done, others also, which had diseases in the island, came and were healed. And so because of that, then, they honored, they stayed there for about three months on the island. The people saw how he had healed uh, him, and they brought other people to Paul for him to be healed, healed, for them to be healed as well. And so now, Paul gets to Rome. Paul, Paul gets to Rome in verse uh, 16. When he arrives in Rome, uh, what we'll notice, again, uh, because God cares for his own. And you need to know that. God cares for his own. Uh, uh, instead uh, of him being thrown into prison, he was allowed to rent a house to live in. Uh, and then, uh, so basically being placed under house arrest because he's still a prisoner, but he's placed under house arrest. So he's not allowed to leave the house. I guess now an ankle bracelet would be what would be taking the place of that. So uh, he wasn't allowed to leave the house, but he could move around freely uh, within the house. And so Paul... As, as being a prisoner, he had the palace guard to, uh, to uh, guard him. That was a group of elite soldiers. They were camped just outside of Rome, and so their primary purpose was to guard the emperor. Their secondary purpose was to guard the prisoners waiting for trial. So Paul spent a lot of time with them. So in, in the time they spent with them, what do you think that he did? He, Absolutely. He did, he did what he was used to doing. And, and, and that amazes me about Paul. I love, I, it helps me to read that, that he was consistent in his mission and he stayed true to his purpose. He never got distracted even uh, with the circumstances that he was in. You know, okay, he was under house arrest and able to move around freely, but he was still a prisoner, and as we have talked about since we began talking about this, he was uh, a prisoner for something that he hadn't done. They could never, they could never uh, bring a valid charge against him. And so he, he, and Paul knew, you know, it's just like I'm here. I'm, a, for, for, I'm, 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 I'm a prisoner, but actually, just I'm a prisoner for God. He absolutely knew that. Uh, for these things they have brought against me, they have no reason, these charges, the things that I've been accused of. And I would have been set free, which he says, I would have been set free. Uh, but uh, they wanted to take me to Jerusalem, and I wasn't going to let them take me to Jerusalem because I knew that I wouldn't get a fair trial. And so... Paul spent time with at least five or six of those soldiers every day, and they had no choice but to hear him preach because, you know, if you're a preacher, you tell me, Pastor Lamb, if you're a preacher, you got to preach. Yeah. 
<laughs> if you're a preacher, you got to preach. Yeah, and, <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And so you just every opportunity you get. But, you know, the message is, is burning so within you that you want to share it. Yeah. And, you know, Paul realized that this message that he had was, was, was freedom for those who took it and believed it. He realized that this was something that was going to free them up, which is why he was just so amazed with the church in uh, Galatia the churches in Galatia. I mean, you've been set free. You've been set free. Y'all, you know, we, 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 when we look back over our lives, let me just talk about me. When I look back over my life and I, 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 I look at how, uh, what bondage I was in, I thought I was free. I thought I was free. Oh my goodness. You know, you're doing this and you're doing that. But actually, once you do it, you go home and you're sad, you go to bed sad, and you wake up sad. But whom the sun sets free, he is free indeed. I thank God for a, a, a freedom that I've never known. I thank God for the liberty that I have in him. I just appreciate God that, you know, I don't have to go to bed uh, feeling guilty. I don't have to wake up feeling guilty. Whom the sun sets free. He's free indeed. And so <clears throat> Paul used his imprisonment for Christ. Even though he was under arrest, he continued to preach to any non-believer who came to see him. Uh, as I said, he even preached to the soldiers with him, and he continued to teach uh, anybody that visited him. He took this time. He took this time. Uh, let's, let, let's go to... Um, Acts the 28th chapter, and uh, da, 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 da. let's go over to the 23rd verse. Are, are you there? And when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him and to his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets, from morning till evening. And some believe, some believe the things which were spoken, and some believe not. And that's always going to be, you can't expect everybody to receive and accept the things that you believe the things that you're teaching, the things that you're preaching. You can't always accept that. There are always going to be some, but that should not sway you from going on in the name of the Lord. Uh, and when they agreed not among themselves, they departed after that Paul had spoken one word. Well spake the Holy Ghost. This is what Paul says, says here. He quotes from Isaiah. He says, well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers, saying, Go unto this people and say, Hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and not perceive. For the heart of this people is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles and that they will hear it. So it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. God has somebody who's going to receive and is going to hear. And that was uh, Paul's ministry, we know, was centered around taking this message to the Gentiles and uh, letting them know that, uh, you know, there was a difference between the Jews and the Gentiles, but because of Jesus Christ uh, and uh, his uh, crucifixion and his resurrection, that middle wall of partition has been broken down because when he presented his blood, he presented it for everybody. 
He presented it for everybody. And so now there is no difference. So I'm, I'm just going to take this message to the Gentiles. And when he said these words, the Jews departed and had great reasoning among themselves. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came in unto him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. And so that's how, how the book of Acts ends. You know, it, it shows us, uh, Paul, how he used all of his time or he used most of his time uh, for Christ. And, and, and the thing about this whole lesson, as we began to talk about Paul and we began to talk about his conversion and after he came back from his time uh, in the uh, Arabian desert, after he came back, what he did and how he remained true and how he uh, used all of the time for Christ in any situation under the most adverse circumstances. Under the most adverse circumstances, he uh, used all of his time for Christ. And so this is how the book of Acts ends with him being in house arrest. Any comments or any observations? Absolutely. Okay. So let's take a breath. Let's take a breath and let's move on to the book of Galatians. I'm going to take a breath. I'm telling you to take a breath. Let me take one. <laughs> and let me get a drink of water. The book of Galatians is um, a great book for us to have some fun with. And I would uh, just say to you, since you know we're in the book of Galatians, we're not going to be here long, but just take a moment to just read through the entire book the entire letter and just read it in one sitting and then you know just just uh, see how Paul puts it together and see how Paul pours out his heart because this is a church that you know we say birthed but um, a church that he established so Paul and Barnabas had passed through this area Lystra Derby all of those areas that that area in Galatia on his first missionary journey, uh, establishing churches there. So uh, when we talk about this particular book, if you look at chapter one and you look at the greeting, we start out by Paul saying he's an apostle. And uh, that's important as we begin the study because his uh, authority was under attack. They uh, attacked uh, his authority as an apostle, I'm not saying that he was not a true apostle. And we'll get to that in just a moment. But uh, you see in verse two, it says, and all the brethren which are with me unto um, the churches of Galatia. So he wrote this not just to one church, but he wrote this to all of those churches that he had established that uh, was established uh, on his uh, missionary journey to this area. So the work that he had done in Galatia as they traveled through there, Pastor Bland, had been uh, successful for the most part. Great multitudes, a lot of people, uh, most of the Gentiles had accepted Christ. But after he left, you remember as he uh, was leaving uh, he called for the Ephesian elders to come to him. Do y'all remember that scene and how poignant that scene was as they lay upon his breast and they clutched him? They didn't want him to go, and uh, he shared with them, look, I've got, I've got to go. i got to go. But I want you to beware. I want you to beware. He's talking to them. The people that's under your care, the people you're overseeing, beware. Because when I leave, I know that grievous wolves are going to come in to try to tear the people apart. 
And what worse way can they tear them apart but by attacking the doctrine that they have already received and you've been established and rooted in? By attacking that, saying that that's not true or something has to be added to it to make it true. So they received Paul and they received that doctrine gladly. But just the same way they received Paul gladly, they received the Judaizers. So the Judaizers came in from Jerusalem. They had come into Galatia and they were teaching that the Gentiles had to put themselves back under bondage. Uh, the bondage being the bondage of the law in order for them to be saved. Now, if you are like me, when you have felt a taste of freedom, when you have tasted it, you don't want to go back to bondage. You don't want to go back to bondage. Mm -mm. I tell y'all all the time, in the natural sense, I don't even like to be locked up in my bedroom. I like to be able to roam around I like to be able to do what, what I want to freely. And so in the spiritual sense, it's the same thing. I don't want to be locked up in my mind because that brings to me, Pastor Land, a type of condemnation. But, and, and I agree with you, Lady Deborah, but the, they call it recidivism. Yes. In, in the penal system. Mm -hmm. Most people that start out because they're institutional lies. It's the, it's the, it's the thinking? Yes, the thinking. absolutely it is. We, so. I was talking about this to someone yesterday. Uh, because when you've been in something so long, it, 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 it takes a whole lot for you to change. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. I, like, I've seen people that came to church here and then they went back to that, that there's no way that I can I just speak for myself um, no way that, that after learning the truth that I could go back and be alright with folks baptizing folks in water and stuff like that and thinking you know they make a big deal out of it and bring the family and, and whatever and, but I guess I'm not convinced in my mind that that's just uh and Paul talks about that in Galatians and Colossians about you going back to a shadow. You, you've come to the truth of the matter. There's nothing wrong with putting people in water and whatever, but if, when, once you find out that it's, it's just like uh, once that you find out that something doesn't help. You know, I, I, something as simple in life as trying to change other people. Once that you are totally convinced in your mind, you get some walking around sense, and you learn that you can't make people care about what they don't care about, and then to go back to doing that, that borders on stupid. Absolutely. So let's just read this introduction. It says, Paul, an apostle, not of man, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. And all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia, grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. I will stop right there. I just can't keep go I can't go forward to say that if you don't have grace, you don't have peace. You don't. And so Paul, this is a standard greeting from him, grace and peace. And so he says uh, in verse 4, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And then he goes in to talk to them about his grave concern. Paul's concern. Paul is concerned. So I came here and established this church and y'all were happy to hear what, what I, I had to say and you grabbed a hold of it and your life got better and your family's life got better. But now there's something different and I'm amazed. Lady Deborah, I guess that's why that 
and I say it, and I know it sounds crazy, but you know, if, if Manassa has to close, and it may, you know, we we talking about we we up we up to uh, we coming up on 17 years, and you know, I don't know how long we can do this. I, I don't, and, and whatever, you know, people think that we robots, and that you know, automatically we can do this, but it takes a toll upon you. It, it, it does, but I said that if, you know, if Manassas closed, I'm not going. I'm, I'm not going, and I guess to just bring it on a more carnal basis, Mother, mother Minnie, it's kind of like you uh, had told me before about your husband. He said, well, Pastor, really, I don't think nobody could measure up. I'm not going to a, a sorry Negro. I done had the best. And now I'm going, you know, so just that, put an analogy like that. So uh, he says, look, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's, that's, that's a sign. That's a red flag, isn't it? Unto another gospel. But he backs it up. In the next verse, he says, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. So um, he says, but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be a curse. Lady Deborah, let me say this right uh -huh. here. And that's another life lesson that, it, that I have to learn is to consider the source of who's criticizing me. You know, the first, the, the, the first hiccup that a family runs into, will run into, is when you've been putting something in your children, the right thing, and they leave out of your house and they come back with something else. You got trouble in your house then. You do, you do, and do, now, because they're going to question the teaching that you've been putting in them, you know, and, and it just, it just causes a problem. Out of that house is where you've been getting your nourishment, out of that house is where you've been getting your direct, you've been getting everything you need mm -hmm. from your parents, but you listen to somebody out here that know they ain't gonna do nothing for you. And you can't, tire, you can't convince them. When I was in that shape and when my children, you can't convince them that, baby, these folks don't know what they're talking about, but, and you have to learn that. Absolutely. And I go further than that is when I had to learn, after I got married, it took about five years. You, you listen to everybody, everywhere, but the one that's up in there help, trying to help you pay them bills. Now, they ain't got no sense, but they helping you pay these bills every day. <laughs> Making up the bed, washing the dishes, Taking care of these little ugly children you got. <laughs> Doing everything, but you can't hear nothing they got to say, but you're hearing everything everybody else got to say. And, and it's just something that you have to learn because there's always, there's always going to be other voices. Yeah. And you have to learn how to discriminate between the voices and whether, if you're going to ever do any good. Absolutely. Because they try to throw you off. So, so, so Paul, Paul, he, he begins to talk to them, and, and it's unfortunate, but, you know, he has to defend his authority uh, because, uh, as I said earlier, the Dewey guys, are, well, they question his authority, and they were saying, you know, how could he tell y'all anything anyway? He's not a real, not a real apostle. <laughs> It's it, it not a real apostle. So, so, so what we know is that while Jesus was here ministering on earth, we know that he had many, many disciples, those who followed after him, his teaching. They, there was many, 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 many. But then he, he, he called out 12 apostles, uh, 12 more, uh, more intimate group. And then uh, later, if, if we look back at Acts uh, one, if we look back at Acts, the first chapter, you'll see where um, one of the requirements was, and I believe it's Acts 1 and 20, uh, Acts 21 and 22. Are you there? 
Wherefore, of these men which have companied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. That's the apostles when they were getting ready to select Matthias uh, as the one to replace Judas. And so uh, that was one of the requirements. And so, you know, his enemies, the Judaizers, said that it, he was not a true apostle because he had not witnessed the resurrection uh, uh, of, um, he had not witnessed, rather, the risen Savior. And so Paul was neither a disciple or an apostle, apostle during Christ's earthly ministry. Well, of course, we know that. But he had seen the risen Savior. He had seen the risen Savior. And his commission came directly from him. He saw him on the road to Damascus. They had an exchange conversation there. And so, therefore, he had the authority. He had the authority to deal with the issues that they were having in uh, Galatia. Not only that, but when you have been with someone laboring with them, Pastor Bland, when you've been there and you've seen what they were and now what they are and the potential for who they could become, when you've uh, taken your time and poured out into them, well, what, you mean I can't tell y'all nothing? <laughs> now that's when you when you look at your children, Pastor Bland, and you looking like I, I, what I'm, I'm I I can't tell y'all nothing. It's gonna happen. <laughs> really? Okay, you questioning everything I say now? Really? And so that's what well, that's the way kind of Paul was saying. That's why he's saying I marvel. I'm scratching my head over here. I'm trying to figure out how. And while I was there, y'all were gung-ho, but now the Judaizers have come in, and because they said one thing, you're going to change what you think? You're going to change the way you look at me? And you're going to change uh, what you think about the gospel that I preached while I was here? And so, uh, you know, Paul, just uh, from the beginning, he clearly stated the message of the gospel, which, uh, which is what the Judaizers, when they came in, that's what they were changing. And that's when he said, let's go back over to uh, Galatians. Like Deborah, I, I just feel compelled to say this right here. And I don't know if it's known the lesson, but it's just in my heart. You know, you talk about parent can't tell the child anything. And even greater tragedy is when the wife can't tell the husband nothing. It's, it's just a, uh, it, 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 it's a world of potential, a world of resource, a world of help that gets wasted. And what you know, ends up even more of a waste is, is that the woman has to choose between uh, being all she can be and keeping her husband because he's so threatened by her uh, talents, her gifts, that if she actually allows God to, 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 to enhance her, he's gonna be threatened and it, it's just, it's, it's a tragedy. And I think that it's something that needs to be emphasized and to be taught in church instead of uh, in church putting women in a subservient position well, women can't do this. Women can't do that. And, and whatever, instead of allowing whatever God, you know, uh, whatever God. Uh, and, and I think that if the spirit of God is dealing with a woman, she, she won't take on that masculine role. I, I don't you know. But, but I think we have to take the risk to stop the waste in, in women's lives the waste in women's lives. Just one more point. I know my wife could have had, uh, not my wife, my, my mom could have had a doctorate degree. I know she could have. But she had an aunt that told her after she got her master's, said don't go no further. 
Say, if you, say, cause you, you'll lose your husband. You know, and she may have, because he went to try to get his masters, but he couldn't get his because he, he was alcoholic. You see, and uh, but I think I mean was in me. It's just you know, it's a waste, and we need to push women. We need to push female. We need to push people to be all they can be, and if other people can't stand it, God bless them. Absolutely. Absolutely. But what you are a gift, whoever you are, you are a gift, and eventually God has put that in you to help everybody. Yes, so yes. That's, um, I appreciate I'm, you saying so that. <laughs> no, I appreciate that. No, because it's meaningful uh, and impactful, brother Alex. But, but Pastor, it's hard to unlearn We don't appreciate our standards in life because we, our standards. Uh, we have a low self-esteem about ourselves, especially black men, because that's what society has done. It has put that mark on us. So we've got to unlearn and undo what they've been, we've been taught to do, which is be subservient, to be less than. And that's our own uh, situation, our own issues. But I agree with the pastor. Our women are so dynamite and they are so strong that we do need to promote them and celebrate them more than what we do. But, but we got to get out, get over our own insecurities. Thank y'all. Thank y'all for that. So, so we'll we'll be looking to see change some changes around here. <laughs> Just for like. <laughs> No, this, this, this is just dynamite, because when you're free in one area, it frees you up in another area. You believe that? That's all Galatians is talking about, you know, you just uh, your freedom in Christ. You would allow someone to threaten your freedom, place you back under bondage, and, uh, you and, know. And Lady Deborah, it's all the, the thinking. It's all the thinking. The tragedy of religion the tragedy of religion, whether it be Christianity, um, being a Muslim or whatever, the tragedy is, is that it depends upon the faithfulness of man. And man can't be faithful. And by being faithful, it means consistent, yeah. always 100% doing the right thing. Yeah. The man can't do it because sin is in his, in his body. And so that's, that's just, that's the tragedy of it. Okay, why does it exist? Why does it keep going? Because we love it. We love our religion. We love the pump, the pad, the pageantry of, you know, they got the rituals in church, in the Baptist church where they walk in and they sway in and they got on the, the, the robes and they sang in them old moaning songs and all this right here, whatever. It's, it's religion and start talking about what you need to do. And they spend the whole time talking about you resisting and not sinning. Instead of talking about what Christ did on our behalf in order to make us righteous with God. Yeah. And so it's a, it's a, to me it's a mindset. It's a mindset. And it's a humbling, it's, it's a, a very humbling mindset yeah. to understand that you threw. You ain't got nothing to offer. And you're going to have to completely lean and depend upon God. It's a very humbling thing. And it goes back to what this guy told me when I, I was in treatment, Lady Deborah, about constant relapse and going back to drugs. He says, it's like being in a fight with Mike Tyson. Don't get, up, don't get back up no more. And so I had to keep that mindset of the fact that I'm nothing. Yeah. I'm nothing. I'm never going to be nothing. I'm never going to be able to, you know, I can, I can look good for a while, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. but, you know, I can't endure to the end. And so I need to place my faith in God instead of my faith in me, which is yeah. Absolutely. Great. This has been great. I've enjoyed it. So um, as you were talking, it, it made me think. And, and we're going to end here, and we'll pick up with uh, Galatians chapter 11 the next time we have the Lord's Academy. So uh, it made me think of how people are, are hungry for something. 
And so that's the danger, Pastor Bland, when you are a leader. People are hungry for something. So you have to be mighty sure of what it is you're putting out for the people to eat. You have to, you know. And people, will, people prefer, they won't say it, they prefer to be fooled than to be told the truth. Wow. Wow. Now they won't admit that. Wow. Wow. But he teaches, he said, and my people love it to be so. Well, with that, we're going to, um, we're going to stop here and pick up uh, in Galatians chapter 1, verse 11 when we uh, meet again. God bless you. Thank you.